Dude, Wednesday morning. Pastor Rob here. Today is our uh, continuing Bible study in Mark chapter 6. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. Of course, we know there was more than 5,000 or 5,000 men. Matthew says that's besides women and children. <clears throat> so they just finished feeding the 5,000. We know that John the Baptist has just been beheaded by Herod. Jesus has not had uh, yet had time to mourn uh, his the, the murder of his cousin. And all this is occurring during this time of where he was hoping to get away and mourn the death of his cousin. So after the feeding of the 5,000, um, which I think is a horrible title, by the way. It's, of course, the titles are by man, feeding of the 5,000. Should be the feeding of the fifteen to 20,000 um, would be the appropriate title there. But anyway, it's no less a miracle that Jesus performed. Um, and so as they're uh, finishing this up, they feed the 5,000. Jesus sends the disciples on ahead of him. He's like, you guys get in the boat and you go back across over towards Capernaum. And uh, I'll catch up with you all later. I'm going to go up on a mountain and I'm going to take this time alone to be with my father and pray. And to mourn my cousin. I haven't had that time yet. So I just point that out because what you're going to see here is that in these next following portion of scripture, from Mark chapter 6, verse 45 over to around 56, we'll finish chapter 6 today. He's really training his disciples. What you're going to see is he it was in the boat with them the last time there was a storm. This time, this is going to be the second storm. Jesus sends the disciples out ahead of him alone. And this is what great leaders do. He's not um, babysitting. He's not a helicopter parent here. He's not a micromanager. He is trying to build within the disciples, a capacity to lead and live. And <clears throat> so he sends them in the boat alone, but you'll notice it's under his watchful eye. This is another training incident uh, for Jesus and the disciples. He's going to say, this time, I was in the boat with you all last time. This time you guys get in the boat, go out ahead of me. I'm going to pray. But what we notice is in this portion of scripture, he's watching the disciples the whole time. And that's very applicable to us. Jesus sends us out. Here we are in this world, in time. And by the way, this is the devil's world. This is not an unarguable thing. This is a fact. The, the prince and power of the air. This is the devil's world. We're out here alone. Jesus is always near us, however. And we're under his watchful eye. And uh, you'll see here, he lets them go. He watches them. When they cry out for help, he's right there to help them. So let's take a peek at this. Another training moment. For the disciples, and this is very accurate, Jesus is always training us as well. Storms are transitional. Storms are for strengthening our faith, for building within the believer a capacity to trust God and to continue on in life. So in Mark 6, 45, it says immediately, there's that word, utheos. Actually, this is the 27th time that this word is used out of 42 in the book of Mark. Immediately, Jesus made he said they had no choice. He's making them get in the boat. And that's what this word here would say. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go out ahead of him to Bethsaida. <clears throat> He's testing him, testing them. And again, I love the, the boat. They're, they're in a boat often. And for those of you that love boats, look at how cool is that. And go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. Well, he dismissed the crowd. What, what speakers don't do that? After a, after a speech, after a message, after feeding the 5,000, Jesus, the center of uh, leadership and attention and miracles and provision, stands there and talks to the crowd while he sends his disciples away. So he stays there, dismisses the crowd. After leaving the crowd, then he goes up on the mountainside, what to pray. He wants to be alone with his father. He's going to grieve his cousin, uh, John the Baptist, being beheaded, being murdered. So he goes up to pray. While the disciples are out on the lake trying to make it to the other side by themselves without Jesus in the boat this time. He goes up to pray and it says when evening came. And by the way, this is about three to six o'clock in the morning because it's going to say the fourth watch. So they're out early in the morning on this Sea of Galilee. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake. And if you read John, uh, John's a quarter of this, it says they were out three to three and a half miles, which I believe that the width of the lake is only about eight miles, six to eight miles. So they're right in the middle of the lake. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. Jesus is alone. This is what he wanted for a moment. He just needed a minute to get away. He always gets away. And every believer, you've sometimes you've got to remove yourself out of all the busyness of 
all the hustle and bustle of each day. Get away, get alone with God. You guys know it's good for you. Get out on the back porch, have a little coffee, read your Bible, just get some silence. And that's what Jesus does. So here's what I'm saying. The disciples, even though he sends them out ahead, they're under his watchful eye. So he looks and it, he sees the disciples straining at the oars. He can see them. He's up on a mountain. He's looking out across the, the lake. It's not that large. He can see them. And they're straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Now I want to stop here. This is verse 48 in Mark chapter 6 because this is very applicable to our day and time. And it's applicable to them because if you read the Greek, this is written for a purpose. And that is, uh, as Jesus builds leaders... And he lets you go out into the life on your own as they went out on the boat on their own. What you're going to have is things that are against you. Anytime you follow God, there is going to come times of training and straining and trial and, and, uh, and conflict because everything God uh, teaches us is contrary to the world we're in. And he sees the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Now this word here is animo, A-N-E-M-O, and the other were following it contrary to them. The wind is, the wind is animo, which stands for empty doctrine, and contrary is E-N-A-N-T-I-O-S, enantios. I don't know how to say that properly, but I looked these up because I just wanted to understand what the wind was, and it's very, very revealing that as they're straining, as we are going out in life doing our thing, Things that are going to come against us in trials and tribulation are winds of empty doctrine. And that's what the wind is. And it's contrary. So it's contrary wind or it would be contrary doctrine. In other words, it's empty doctrine that's actually opposite of what we, sh we should be believing in the word of God. And this is what we face in the world every day. Empty doctrine. How many millions of ideas do you see? That people say, this is the right way. This is how you should think. This is the way to salvation. This is the way to heaven. This is the way to do things. Remember, the, the way to, of the world is very wide. The way to heaven and to follow Jesus Christ is very narrow. That's Matthew 7. And so there's many ways to do different things. Doesn't mean any of them are correct. The one correct way to live your life is according to the word of God, according to the Ten Commandments, in the following Jesus Christ. We should have the mind of Christ. But in this world, we're going to strain with that. Why? Because everywhere you go, and I've gone to, you know, any of you that's gone to a, a school, a university, a college, anywhere, their teaching is going to be contrary. And I would say 99% of the time, because when I was at Florida, um, we, we literally had one doctor there that was a, a Baptist preacher that did think with the Word of God as he taught. It was very interesting, but only one out of all the professors that I had in college. There, All these things they're teaching are counter-scripture, counter-biblical, counter-faith. It uh, doesn't mean they're hostile. It just means they, they're not going to they're not gonna think with the Word of God. So when you go to college, when you get out in the world, everything you face and a majority of the things that you face are going to be counter-scriptural. And so that's what this is. In this world, as they're going out in the boat, they're, they're going against the winds that are contrary to them. And in our life, we're going to be against doctrines that are contrary to the word of God. That's what this is, a teaching moment for Christ, that Christ is giving the disciples. He wants them out on the water to see how they're going to handle the second storm. Remember that. There was already one storm. The first storm was in Mark chapter 4, where he was in the boat with them. Now they're out on the storm, stormy sea alone. So he sees them straining. But one thing I want to say here, too, is he, they didn't give up. They're still straining. So there's a little bit of capacity, a little bit of faith building in them, a little confidence in what they're doing on the lake. They're not giving up. So as a believer, when you hit hard times, don't give up. Stay in there. Hang tough. He sees them straining. He's watching. God's watching. He's near. About the fourth watch of the night, he decides he's going out to them. He's going to go near them. Doesn't mean he necessarily going to help them at this time. He just wants to be near them. And actually, if you read the Greek here, the intention was to pass by them because he wants to see them make it on their own. And sometimes we got to do it with our kids. We got to cut them loose. We got to let them out in the world and do their own thing. And sometimes they're going to skin their knee and all that stuff. And you got to let them do it. People have to get their own bumps and bruises to mature. And this is what Jesus is doing. I'm going to walk by. That's his intention. But about the fourth watch, he went out to them. 
walking on the lake. Two things. He's watching them and he's near them. Same with each believer today. He's watching us and he's near us. He was about to pass by, which was his intention. Verse 49. But then they saw him. Now, here you go. Here's our relief. This is what happens. Same with your kids. Uh, you know, you, you, you send your kids out. They're playing. They're straining. They're doing something. And the moment they see you, they're like, come help me. And that's what happens. If you leave them alone, they might just keep trying. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. And they cried out. And they cried. So they, 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 they cried out very loudly. Help us. Help us. And because they all saw him. And they were terrified. They're like, is this a ghost? Is this a phantom? They're not understanding this moment, by the way. This is a teaching moment. He's building within them the capacity to sail these seas alone. And that's what Jesus is doing with each one of us. Just to live this life, to walk it, to be strong, to be faith, uh, faithful believers and knowing he's nearby. He's always watching. And if we do need him, cry out and he'll be there. They were terrified immediately. Here's that Uthios again. That's the 28th use of this word. He spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Now I want to stop there. Then the reason I want to stop there is because now you've got to turn your Bible to Matthew 14. Matthew 14 handles this same scenario, the same instant, a little differently. And a lot of you have heard Peter walking on the water. Well, Mark doesn't cover that, but Matthew does. So uh, during the fourth watch in Matthew 14:25. He went out to them walking on the water when the disciples saw him in the lake. They were terrified. It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. And this is Matthew again. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Now, this is where it changes from Mark to Matthew. Peter replies, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to onto the water. And he says, come on. Come on, man. That's just what we do with our kids when they're learning how to walk and they're on the wall and you know they can do it. They're two years old or one and a half years old. And you're like, come on, buddy. I got you. Come on, walk over. This is what Jesus is doing. Keep your eyes on it. What's the key here? Keep your eyes on Christ. And what you're going to see is Peter gets his eyes off Christ and gets a little discouraged. So Jesus says, come. So Peter gets out of the boat. Your kids, if they trust you. I got a film of a, having my son about 14 feet, 12, 12, 14 feet in the air and saying jump. And he just jumped. Then I caught him because he, he trusts his dad. There's confidence and your kids are going to trust you. And uh, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to the water. Jesus says, come. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But look at verse 30 of Mar uh, Matthew 14. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. What's he do? And we do this very often. When you get your eyes off Christ, things change. Your mentality changes. Your confidence changes. Your priorities change. And that's what happened to Peter. When he got his eyes off Christ, he started to look around. He saw the wind. And he was afraid and began to sink. This is a teaching thing for all of us, applicable to all of us. If we keep our eyes on Christ, we can remain confident. How do we get messed up? How do we lose faith? We take our eyes off Christ. We look at all the stuff around us and we go, oh my gosh, I can't handle this. And you know, honestly, we can't. There's a lot going on in the world today. Keep your eyes on Christ. Stay focused on Christ. And he's right there to help you. Help us all. I mean, I need it too. Believe me, when I start looking around at the world, I look at the bills, look at our health. I mean, being a disabled vet and all that really can be, uh, can be overwhelming. But uh, you got to keep your eyes on Christ, keep faith, and keep strong. That's what Jesus wants. So Peter got out of the boat. He walks on the water. But when he saw the wind, when he saw the... We so said, this is what can happen. So the wind, again, is empty doctrine. As a believer, and specifically when we go to college, a lot of things will happen. You get taught different things contrary to the Word of God. You start hearing this empty doctrine. You start getting bombarded by all these different beliefs. It doesn't mean they're correct. It doesn't mean you can't learn from them. But certainly, it can distract you from the true meaning of life, from the true source of life, and from the truth of the Word of God. But keep your eyes focused. So this empty doctrine comes around Peter, and he starts to lose faith. He's confused. He starts to sink. And he, he got afraid and began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. What happens? Verse 31 of Matthew 14. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And what's he say? This is why I say, keep your eyes on Christ. Because you lose faith when you don't. You of little faith, he said, why'd you doubt? Now, in this world today, you can get looking around, you can see things. And honestly, 
people are so good at sometimes even making things up. It can discourage you and it can get you to doubt your faith. It can get you, and believe me, in college, I doubted many times. I would go to professors and say, prove to me what you're teaching me, you know, evolution and all that stuff they teach. And they couldn't do it. It's all faith. Everything is faith. So you just have to make a decision. We have to make a decision who I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow the, the next wave of the world, the next fad in the world, or am I going to stay with the truth from the beginning of time, which is Christ Jesus. And so Peter loses faith because he got distracted. He allowed himself to be distracted. He got his eyes off Christ. He started to sink. But Jesus saved him. And you can cry out. We can all cry out any moment. You get yourself deep into something. Just cry out to God. Lay it all at his feet. Let him bail you out. And it doesn't mean you won't have to live with the, the consequences. There are consequences sometimes, a bad decision. But hang in there. So he gets in the boat. <clears throat> Take courage. It is I. This is back in Mark chapter 6, verse 51. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. Now, this doesn't read properly, this, this um, translation. It, it works. But what it really means is that he climbed into the boat and he calmed the wind and then it, be, it became it. But what really happens here too is when they call out to him, he comes to them and a great calm comes over them. If your life is a shambles, if you're caught up and you're pulling your hair out trying to figure out what's going on, cry out to God. Take a moment. Put, put a towel over your head. Put, get under the blanket. Hide in the corner. Get in a closed closet. Say, God, I can't do it any longer. Men, it's okay. Go to God. You don't have to tell the whole world if you're struggling with something. I know as a vet, we, we have unique struggles in our community. Guys, get in a corner with God. Call a buddy. Pray out. Cry out to God for help. And he'll come help you. So he climbs into the boat. And there's an amazing mega calm over everything. There's a calm over the wind and the doctrine. God has priority and he has authority over any other doctrine in the world. And when people realize that a great calm comes over them and we give him control. So it was an amazing calm. It says they were amazed uh, for they did not understand. They didn't understand the loaves, how he fed the 15,000. He doesn't, they don't understand how he calms a storm. All they know is they can see the results. They don't know how he did it, but it did, it happened. And there, it says their hearts were hardened. So they were starting to like push back a little bit. They're struggling uh and and uh they don't understand it and it's hard to understand when you don't have the capacity to understand you haven't prayed for it and certainly when you're not operating in the spirit so if you're not a believer it's very difficult to follow the word of god when they had crossed over they landed at genesaret and anchored there as soon as they got out of the boat again um people recognized jesus they ran to the whole region carrying the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. Whenever he went to villages, countryside, he just kind of wraps this chapter up right here, chapter 6. Anywhere he goes, they place sick in the marketplace as they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. As we know, the woman with the issue of blood, what did she do? If I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just get a little bit of Jesus today, then I'll be all right. And that's kind of like, I tell everybody, read one verse. Well, Rob, I don't have time to study for an hour. Read one verse. Take that with you. Write it down. That takes 30 seconds. Write that down while your Pop-Tart's in the, in the toaster. And before it pops up, you'll have a verse written down to take with you and meditate on all day. That's, that's enough to have God in your life if you're busy. They begged him. Uh, they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. If you're struggling, if there's anything wrong, if you need to be healed from your sin, if you just need help in life, Look at this. Just get a little touch of the hem of the garment of the king and he can heal you. And at least if you're still struggling and it may take time, at least get started. Touch the hem of his garment. Start walking. And even over time, God will get your life organized for you. Help you think differently. Think properly. Be focused. And even in the struggle in a world full of counter doctrines, you can become strong in this world and gut it out. So, um, I guess that's it for today. We just finished chapter six. They were on the water again, the disciples. Jesus is training them to be independent. Any good leader raises leaders. At one point, he was in the boat with them. And then at this point, they're, he's not. So he's building within them a capacity of faith just to be able to face this world, this controversy or 
contrary to their lifestyle, contrary to the teachings of God. So hope everybody has a great day. Stay strong. God's right there. He's always watching. He's always near you. Don't be afraid to cry out when you need to. And he can bring a great calm into your life. All credit to Jesus Christ, our Savior. We'll see you all tomorrow.